Bernard, Kyle, it's great to see you guys. Great to be with you. Yeah. So we're here at the Siafu Men's House yeah. in Oakland, California. You guys are the pastors of Tapestry Church here in this vibrant community. It's such an honor to have you guys on the show. Man, it's an honor to be here. So uh, to start off, tell us about Tapestry Church. What is it? Why did you guys start it? What's, what's different about you guys? The church I was pastoring just happened to be uh, just just happenstance, uh -huh. just happened to be a predominantly black church. And uh, the church yeah. Kyle was pastoring uh, just happened to be a predominantly white church. That just happens to happen. Yeah, it often. just happens yeah, that way. Right. <laughs> and uh, we met at uh, a Bay Area, the Bay Area clergy cohort, which okay. was centered around um, social justice and okay. community organizing. Okay. And uh, in particular, we met during this exercise where um, the uh, facilitator had us all leave out of the room. Mm. And when we came back in the room, the chairs were in the shape of a pyramid. Mm. Yeah, so with, we come back in the room, chairs are in a pyramid, and uh, once everybody's back in the room, the facilitator says, okay, now I want you to sit in the seat where society tells you you belong. Mm. And, you know, nobody's making a mad dash for those seats, but the ones in the front, you know, they've got some more space Mm -hmm. around them more leg room they're clean the ones in the back have trash on them mm -hmm. they they're tight no leg room no shoulder room mm -hmm. and he says sit in the seat where society tells you you belong so uh, bernard goes and sits in the back row mm -hmm. and i characteristically was talking to somebody during the facilitator's directions and all the other white men with loads of privilege in the room decided to sit in rows two and three uh -huh. <laughs> And, and the rest of them had filled up by that point. And so I basically, I had the front seat <laughs> left to me. Yeah. Uh, so, so here is Bernard in the back, me in the very, very front. And we're processing for a while, you know, what is it like to be here? Like, why did you sit where you sit? Mm -hmm. It's a really emotional right. time. Mm -hmm. And like everybody for a variety of reasons feels a whole lot of things, including like shame and mm -hmm. anger mm -hmm. yeah. and all kinds of things right mm -hmm. we're all sharing this with each other and then the facilitator says well if you don't like the way the world has arranged you reimagine the system mm -hmm. which which we sort of took as a as, like reframing it in like a, in christian language mm -hmm. like imagine what the kingdom of god is like mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. if we're all included yeah like imagine what that would be like so we all yeah. stand up mm -hmm. and we all start to move our our chairs out of the way and, and, he, and he stops us and he says, whoa, 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 whoa. How do you think that you could possibly reimagine such an entrenched system? We all got done talking about how deeply embedded this is in our lives and in our mm -hmm. stories and every aspect of our lives. How do you think you could do that without talking to each other? And so at, at that point, uh, Kyle came in the back row, you know, because I was sitting in the back and no, there's no work that goes on in the back. So when everybody else was moving seats, I was still sitting there. Yeah. But uh, <laughs> Kyle uh, walked up to me and he said, uh, man, what do I need to do? And uh, as a result, he says, I've been telling him what to do ever since. <laughs> <laughs> but but, but uh, that, that birthed the idea of Tapestry Church. We wanted to reimagine the system, mm -hmm. the church, the way God imagines it. Mm. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, and the way God sees it is multicultural, mm -hmm. uh, multi-ethnic. Yeah. And um, so and that got uh, that sparked the idea, and uh, we we got to uh, talking. What would it be? What what would it be like for us to do something radical and reimagine this system? Mm -hmm. Wow. And and, and uh, do something radical like merging our two churches. Yeah. So that's where the conversation started. That's incredible. So that started with the vision of saying, how can we better reflect the kingdom of God yeah. in our community? Are there things since the time that that happened and tell us maybe the time frame there, um, are there things that have happened that have enabled you guys to do that in the city of Oakland? Sure. Um, well, uh, it was a two year process. Okay. It was a two year process. First, uh, uh, we like to uh, say we were dating. Sure. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah, we were dating and Kyle and I, took a, a long walk in the Laurel neighborhood of uh, East Oakland. <laughs> yeah. And, uh, 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 and, and that started the dating process. And uh, on that day, I remember specifically, 
we committed to each other that if we were going to do this, yeah. we would have to be better brothers than we were pastors. Yeah. yeah. And, um, so, so good. yeah. And so, so that meant, um, uh, uh, whatever, whatever happens, we'll be able to work through yeah. it. Yeah. yeah. And, uh, and if we, even if we can't, we will always get up from the table and still be brothers. Yeah. yeah. And, um, so we committed to be better brothers than we are pastors. And that means in essence that, our brotherhood trumps my blackness. Yeah. And uh, 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 our brotherhood trumps his whiteness. Yeah. So yeah. We're, we will always be brothers no matter what. Yeah. Yeah. That's really powerful. Yeah. That was a, that was a really big moment for us just to just to be able to say outright, like, we would rather lose our ministry than lose our relationship. Mm-hmm. Like that. And it has to be that. Yeah. Or else this isn't going to work because we are the like the most radically different people yeah like background wise personality wise yeah. like yeah. Er, like so many ways yeah uh and yeah. we thought we this just has to be like a radical commitment yeah like a covenant right you know right. like it just isn't gonna break yeah right um and then and so we got our churches you know involved at that yeah. point and said hey you know what do you guys think should we do this both churches were stoked about it yeah they both were like okay yeah we're in like wow. to a surprising yeah Degree. That's amazing. I think that there was a standing ovation yeah. at the way church yeah. when you when you, when when you announced, it, announced yeah. it or brought it forward. Yeah. Um, you know, we had a little bit of a different way, so we all had like a community meeting and like yeah. discussed it. Yeah. But everybody was super positive, so we started this two year journey yeah. where we where we were saying, okay, we need to just we didn't know it was going to be two years at the time, mm-hmm. but we knew we needed to set up regular rhythms of just being in each other's lives yeah. as wow. churches mm-hmm. in order to grow into one church. Yeah. So you started a regular rhythm of getting to be in each other's lives and community with each other over that dating process. Your church is now yeah. needed to date. Right. That's right. Yeah. That's right. Yeah. So we so we started uh, meeting together every eight weeks for worship. Okay. Um, and we would switch off okay. at each other. So every yeah. eight weeks we'd shut down Oakland Communion and move over to the Way and go worship with them. Mm-hmm. And every eight weeks the Way would shut down worship and come worship with us. Yeah. And we did that for about a year. Okay. And we got to what we now have learned to describe as uh, base camp. Yep. Mm. You know, like when you're climbing Everest, mm-hmm. yeah. you got to take like three weeks yeah. and just be mm-hmm. where you are so that you can acclimatize. Yeah. And we didn't really realize that that's what we were doing. Mm-hmm. But we had gotten to a point where we had, we had pretty much acclimatized. Yeah. And then Charlottesville happened. Right. Um, so Bernard called me the morning that all of the chaos started erupting in Charlottesville. Mm-hmm that Saturday morning and he said, man, there has got to be a sustained communal response Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. from the church Mm -hmm. that is more than just a tweet or a Facebook post saying this is wrong. Right. Like there has got to be something that we do and we've been sitting at base camp Mm -hmm. for too long. We need to kick this into high gear and really unify these churches and send a message that peace, the peace that we're all longing for really is possible. Yeah. That's that's really powerful. Yeah, were you gonna say something? No. <laughs> so uh, after that, we uh, kicked our meetings up to every four weeks. Okay. Mm-hmm. And um, then we uh, we went through um, this uh, eight week devotional, um, which involved some journaling called multi ethnic conversations. Okay. Yeah. Mark D. Moss. Yes. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. And um, um, and we would uh, journal during the week, and we would come in on Sundays. Um, both communities were going through this at the same time. Mm-hmm. We bought it for everybody That's awesome. in, in the church. Yeah. And uh, we would journal during the week and we would come in on Sundays and we wouldn't even preach, but we would talk about what wow. we journaled during mm-hmm. the week. Mm-hmm. And that opened the door for some much needed uh, uh, conversations mm-hmm. and it g- gave us the chance to disciple some folks through mm-hmm. some stuff. Yeah, yeah, right. Sometimes we look at you know the end goal as the be all end all, but a lot of it's about the process and about yeah. the sanctification, about the growth that happens in, in that journey. You know, it's funny that you use the analogy of, you know, a dating process when my wife and I were getting to know each other is like, you know, we, we met on March 1st in 2007 and we started dating in March 1st, 2008. And that year long, like me being the, the proactive, persistent guy, like I wanted that to be a much shorter window. Uh-huh. And my wife was, you know, taking her time. But during that time, <laughs> I grew in the patience that I needed to grow in. Yeah. She grew in the communication skills that she needed to grow in. Mm. And those have really sustained us through now almost 10 years of marriage because we had that foundation mm. of friendship, just like you guys mentioned, 
to be able to sustain when things come your way, yeah. you know where you came from, you know your foundation, yeah. and you can move forward with a position of strength. Yeah. yeah, yeah, that's really well said. I mean, that for us, the things that we needed to grow in were, were um, a com- confidence mm. that will be accepted mm. and just to be ourselves mm-hmm, mm-hmm. and willingness to uh, exist in discomfort. Yeah. Right. Like for yeah. so those conversations, those eight weeks that we shared with uh, with uh, multi ethnic conversations journaling, mm-hmm. no matter what the subject was, just about every single week the same things came up for both churches, like mm-hmm. different things yeah. for each church, but the same yeah. thing every week, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. So yeah. for Oakland Communion, for the church that I had planted, it was discomfort. Mm-hmm. It's like, well, I come, you know, the reason I come here is because I like the right. way it is. Right. I like the music. Yeah. I like the style of preaching. Right. I like the way we are, you know, we just hang out and relaxed and yeah. I like the people and the way that I, I just kind of get right. the people here Right. and it's all going to change and that's yeah. all going to be really uncomfortable yeah. and we're not going to necessarily yeah. like, like the music every week or mm-hmm. we're not necessarily going to like, we're going to have to figure out how to, how to enjoy like different styles of mm-hmm. preaching and worship and how to speak with people who have radically different lives right. and it's not just going to be like, cool our friends are here and like easy to get to know folks are here man i'm just sitting here thinking white people in their comfort (laughs) right (laughs) well for real but that's that's a real thing and that's the reason i think that that's a big part of the reason why that was oakland communions thing and Mm -hmm. it wasn't the ways thing Uh because the world is set up for people like me to be comfortable sure and and so any discomfort feels like something that needs to get squashed rather than a normal part of life Mm -hmm. Where, where do you think that comes from I, I think that comes from an enormous amount of privilege in the world, which I don't use in a pejorative sense, like sure. you're in a, inherently a bad person for sure. having it. Yeah. But when you when you exist in a world that was set up uh, for people who are like you mm-hmm. or who look like you to succeed in some kind of way, that means it's set up for you to be comfortable. Sure, sure. Uh, and, and, and because it's set up that way and because you have communities of people mm-hmm. who, who have always sort of experienced that as sure. not everyday reality, sure. but the general tenor of life, mm-hmm. then when things are uncomfortable, mm-hmm. something feels like the world is not the way it's supposed to be. Mm-hmm. Right. Whereas if you're in a community that has experienced a lot of suffering mm-hmm. or has experienced a lot of oppression or marginalization... Mm-hmm. When you experience some discomfort, Mm -hmm. you're not like, the world is coming to an end. You're like, right, that's how the world is. Right. Right. So when you're in a community that's, that's experienced comfort their whole life, and then you say, come to a church that's going to be naturally uncomfortable for Mm -hmm. you. Mm -hmm. It seems like the opposite reason for going to a church that you would naturally have. Right. Mm -hmm. Right. So, so that was your congregation struggle. Bernard, how about you guys? So, uh, in my congregation, it was, uh, uh, will they accept me? If I bring who I am to the table, would they accept me for who I am? Mm. Um, you know, uh, 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 black people, we're chameleons. Mm. Um, we uh, 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 change to, uh, and we adapt to situations. And uh, I heard this uh, this joke this comedian told the other day. And uh, he was like, uh, uh, yeah, you know, uh, uh, Bobby, that ain't the real Bobby you're getting at work. He don't act like that for real. <laughs> <laughs> I, I had a, a friend of mine who is black and he talked about like what number of, of him people were going to get. He's hmm. like, when I show up to church, I'm at about maybe a two out of 10. He's like, wait wow. till you see me other places. I might be like, you know, more of like a seven or eight. Right. If you really know me, you might get a 10 out of 10. Right. Wow. Yeah. Wow. And, and, and that's, and so, and it's so like, we're going to be with them all the time. So naturally who we are is going to come out. Right. And so when it comes out, will they accept me with it? Will they still yeah. think I'm cool yeah. when all that blackness comes out? Yeah. 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 Wow. So how have both of these things played out as your churches have merged, as the, the fabric has become intertwined? That's a good question. Yeah. I think it's probably it's all been totally neat, and no messy at all. Oh yeah, yeah. yeah. No, it's just we snapped our fingers. We went through the <laughs> eight week journal, and then everybody was like, yeah, "It Good. works like magic." Yeah, yeah. No, sorry, Mark Dumas. Uh, you know, the journal was a great starting spot, but it didn't solve everything. Right. I mean, he knows that, right? Yeah. Right. But uh, no, I mean, I, th- I think that truthfully, that probably is a different answer for every person. Right. Mm-hmm. Um, but sort of the macro scale. 
Um, well, for one thing, we are about the same size as we were a year ago mm-hmm. when we started, mm-hmm. but we're almost 80% different yes. people than mm-hmm. when we started. Mm-hmm. So that, that just means that, uh, well, people leave for all kinds of different mm-hmm. reasons. Mm-hmm. That's a pretty high rate of right. turnover, right. Mm-hmm. Right. Um, and higher than either of our churches had experienced before that. Right. Um, so there's a sense in which you know you can get ready for something intellectually, mm-hmm. even mm-hmm. emotionally. Yeah. And then you experience it day in and day out, mm-hmm. and you start going, "Ooh, yeah, yeah. I, I don't man, know. I, I didn't sign up for this. Man, I'm pretty uncomfortable. <laughs> right. right. Man, I don't know if I feel totally accepted. Right. Um, so so we have experienced a lot of turnover. Yeah. Um, but we've also experienced a ton of transformation yeah. and yeah. grace yeah. given and received in people's lives. We've had to navigate more situations, uh, relational situations yeah. in the last year than and, we had to. <laughs> and and I think the people that are there now are all in. Yeah. 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 I, I would say they're all yeah. in. They're they're up for the hard work. Uh, they're they're up for the challenge. Yeah. I, I, I would say they're all in. Yeah. Yeah, it's a hard church to be in and just coast. Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Because just in your everyday encounters and relationships, right? You you're gonna have to put in some work. And one of the things we said from the beginning was, like, if we don't become more like Jesus, if we don't grow in the fruit of the Spirit, yeah, this is gonna be a failed experiment. Right. Yeah. And and that's what was exciting to us about it. Right. It's like we would actually have to grow. Yeah. To be a part of church, which wow. seems like something. You, know, you, you would kind of expect for that to be normal for everybody, right? <laughs> right. Yeah. 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 Right. Wow. So currently, you guys are both involved with a lot of different things through the church. And maybe I'll ask each of you for some specifics. I know, Kyle, you're involved with some stuff in the community, both on the educational reform front, as well as in ending gun violence. You want to tell us about that? And, and why are those things that you see as in your jurisdiction as a pastor. Isn't that just supposed to be for other people? Well, one thing I'll say is whatever we're doing, we're doing together. So the stuff that I'm involved in, he's involved in. At least I pull him into. And the stuff that he's involved in, he pulls me into. Naturally. Like like there's nothing that we do. And Pastor Catherine, uh, our associate pastor, is in everything as well. So Mm -hmm. we don't do any of this stuff alone. But yeah, I mean, we always have seen working in the community uh, for the betterment of the community spiritually mm-hmm. and materially mm-hmm. and intellectually mm-hmm. and relationally, economically. Right. That Because God cares about all of those aspects mm-hmm. of us, mm-hmm. the church ought to care about all those aspects of the community. Sure. Like If we're not doing that, then we aren't giving people a taste of God's real love right. for them. Sure. We're just giving them... We're just giving them this... this you know, if God's real love for them t- has all of these notes of taste in it, and it has the bitter, it has the mm-hmm. sweet, it has the salt, it has the sour, it has all that. We're just giving them spiritual. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Then we're leaving out all of the roundness of right. what God offers. Yeah. And uh, and so so all of that is in our purview of responsibility as yeah. a church. Um, at least that's how we see yeah, it. Yeah, that's so good. That's so good. So Bernard, for you, a question that I wanted to ask you is. Mm-hmm. In conversations that you've probably had with others in the black community that don't understand the heart or the why behind what you've done and just kind of shake their heads, what does your conversation look like with those individuals? Um, to tell you the truth, I haven't um, had much opportunity to have those conversations. Mm-hmm. I know uh, um, people uh, uh, think of crazy. <laughs> yeah. Um, but, um, that's because they know me <laughs> <laughs> and uh, um, but I just um, and part of the, the reason we did this was to uh, to spark hope and uh, courage in those mm-hmm. um, people that would do something radically the same mm-hmm, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Or, or, or if not radically different yeah to mm-hmm. uh, to uh, ensure uh, um, uh, God's kingdom looks like God's kingdom. Mm-hmm, yeah. mm-hmm. So um, um, I haven't really had the chance to have those conversations. Um, I know I uh, I shared a, 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 my brother Michael Paisley. He always reminds me um, when he talks about tapestry. He said, "Man, uh, man, you're really doing it." I said, "Yeah, yeah man. It looks like 
uh, is happening. And uh, he always reminds me, man, I remember you saying that uh, it was multi-ethnic church or bust. Yeah. Because uh, I had, um, we, we were, um, we were uh, it was always our desire to be multi-ethnic, mm-hmm. but it was hard making it happen. Yeah. And um, uh, and it just wasn't happening. Mm-hmm. And um, I, before you merged. Yes. Okay. And so that um, was a goal of your yes, congregation. Yes. Always. Okay. okay. And um, 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 so I said, man, if it doesn't happen in the next year, I'm out. Yeah. Uh, I'll find something else to do. Yeah. And uh, because I knew that was yeah. God's vision yeah. for His church. Yeah. Mm-hmm. What did that? So, how did you arrive to that spot where you knew that was God's vision for His church? Man, it's funny you ask. I was praying one morning, uh, one Sunday morning, and uh, I said, "Well," and and I usually don't talk to God like this. <laughs> and I said, "Well, God, if you send one white person through those doors, I'll stick with it." And um, I told it's Kyle. Like Sodom and Gomorrah. And I usually don't talk to God like that. Yeah, I don't. I don't issue out uh, uh, stuff like that yeah. to him. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, um, and uh, 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 we had a knock at the door at the uh, old Melrose School where we met. Uh-huh. And um, I went to open the door, and I, I took too long, so the guy went to the other door, okay. and he knocked on that door. And then about the time I walked to that one, he walked back to the other door. And then uh, he knocked on the other door. And then um, the custodian who lets us in the school yeah. answered the door. And this tall white guy came in. And uh, he said, is this the way church? And I'm like, yeah. And he's like, cool, am I on time for worship? And I'm like, yeah. <laughs> and then um, I'm like, you sure this is the church you're looking for? And he said, this is the way, right? I said, yeah, but it's another one in Berkeley. Yeah. <laughs> Man, I'm assuming it did, yeah, I yeah, <laughs> No, I was trying to send him there. It's another one in Berkeley. Maybe you got this one mixed up with that one. He's like, no. Um, I got some friends that recommended this church to me. I'm from Texas, and my, my friends came back to Texas, and they told me about this church. And just that moment, I remember that prayer. I yeah. prayed to God, and I said, well, it looks like I'm locked in. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <that's> <laughs> That's so good. One other question that I have for you guys is a lot of times when you think of the pastor's role, you think of that singularly, you know, as, mm-hmm. as a pastor, that there's a lead pastor of this church or is the senior pastor or whatever. According mm-hmm. to the study that I've done, there's no reference in the New Testament of, of a singular pastor. Mm-hmm. It's, you know, in Ephesians 4, it's plural there. And the rest of the time it's, it's used, you know, in, in maybe a verb form or different usage. Mm-hmm. So mm-hmm. have you guys seen there be strength in getting to do this together? And, and what, oh, how man. would you speak to that if other churches are listening in that might be fronted by one pastor? <laughs> well, uh, uh, I'll start by saying this. My wife says she likes me better on Sunday mornings now. <laughs> Yeah. Enough said. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that pretty much sums it up. I, 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 I will say that uh, about two months after we started Tapestry, yeah, I started to realize, oh, I felt so guilty mm. all the time mm. when I was doing it on my own. I would because I was preaching every single week. Mm-hmm. And church planting doesn't necessarily allow you to spend, you know, a good 20 hours on a right. sermon every week, <laughs> right, right, right. uh, like they taught you in seminary, you yeah, know, yeah. Uh, as great as that would be, uh, it, you know, every time I'd be doing something else yeah. that would feel like, mm-hmm. oh, I, I have to do this. Right. I like, I have to pay yeah. the rent and right. like f- work that through our books. And yeah. I have to mm-hmm. do all this other, you know, that everything that goes with church planting, I'd always have in the back of my mind, like. I should be working on that sermon. I should be working on that sermon. I didn't realize till we had been in it a couple of months and we were trading off Mm -hmm. weeks and Catherine was taking every fifth week. And so basically we're preaching like two out of five weeks. Yeah. Realized like, oh, wow. I was living with that in the back of my head. Yeah. All the time while I was doing everything else. Yeah. And now I can just do the work of the, I can just be a pastor. Yeah much more freely yeah. in all the other stuff that I'm doing. Not to mention like come back to preaching feeling like super excited to do it Yeah, because 
now I've been sitting on what I've been sitting on for the last mm-hmm. two weeks or yeah. three weeks and like pumped about sharing it. Yeah. Um, that's been amazing. And just the ability to like reach out to each other when we're like, Hey, mm-hmm. I'm actually feeling like, like I'm this close to burning out. Yeah. And have the other person say, get out of here. Yeah. Like, what are you still doing here? Yeah. We've got this. Yeah. Like there are two more of us. Right. Hey, why are you still here? You yeah. know, uh, like the, Pastor Bernard is really good about that. And, uh, and that's been a real big gift to me. Wow. I get, it's hard to like even imagine going back to doing it yeah. oh, on yeah. our own. Oh no. That's no. to say nothing about, <laughs> no. that's to say nothing about like all the ways that we're so different, the three sure. of us mm-hmm. and mm-hmm. add to each other's gifts. Yeah. Right. Like there's all that too, but like, man, there's so much more than that. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. That's, that's encouraging. So you guys are in a neighborhood that's about 70% Hispanic. Yeah. Yeah. I know that something you've been intentional to do is conduct certain parts of your service, whether it's maybe do a song or two in Spanish or maybe a couple verses and, and as much as you can in other elements. Um, what does that look like in practicality? And uh, is that, it, it, it sounds like, man, that's, that's a lot of work to do. Why is that something you guys have prioritized? Mm. Man, um, we are in a neighborhood that is, uh, like you said, 70 70- percent uh latino and uh uh we would dishonor uh the people in our neighborhood if we didn't work hard at that Mm -hmm. yeah it it would be a dishonor to them Mm -hmm. and um um, anybody out there listen uh our our ideal worship leader would be a latina Uh, so if you're out there uh and you're bilingual uh we are uh we are open for business yeah Yeah. (laughs) Plug. Yeah. Plug. <laughs> Insert it. Insert it. You guys hear that now? Yeah. Yeah, but we we would it, it would we would be doing our neighborhood a disservice. Yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah, I mean there there are a number of really great churches mm-hmm. in our neighborhood mm-hmm. who are only Spanish speaking churches. Sure. Mm-hmm. There are a lot of churches in our neighborhood who are only English speaking churches. Yeah. I don't know of many. I could be I could just be missing them, but I don't know of many that are that are bilingual. Mm-hmm. And there are actually a lot of people mm-hmm. in our neighborhood who are bilingual or whose families are bilingual. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And so maybe the parents are going to a Spanish-only speaking right. service, but the right. kids don't want to yeah. go to that because mm-hmm. that's not their, their own linguistic Our culture mm-hmm. yeah. and so they, you know they might they might be looking for a place where as a whole family they can they can worship together yeah. and all be included right um, so that there's there's a space for them that needs to be created that yeah. I'm not sure if it has been created just yet yeah mm-hmm. um, and practically that just means like we we just try to include we try to include Spanish in like every everything that we do mm-hmm. at some level mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. as best as we can who yeah. are not native speakers right yeah. so like yeah. You know, we, like we just did a backpack giveaway today right. and the card that goes in it says, uh, you know, like just, this is just a gift from Tapestry Church because, uh, porque Dios te ama. Yeah. He really does. Yeah. You know, so it's like it goes it back and forth and the invitation because to come really is both you. because right. he really right. loves you. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and that, um, that's, that's just a big part of the, like to, to get that for somebody who's Spanish speaking or for yeah. a kid mm-hmm. whose parents speak Spanish at home. Right. Mm-hmm. And whose teachers speak Spanish at school yeah. or speak English at school? Yeah, to be able to go back and forth like that, mm-hmm. it just feels a little bit more like home and like God cares about your actual culture. Yeah, and and I'll I'll mention tonight after we're done recording this, what what are we doing here at this Yahoo house? We're gonna have a uh, a session with you, <laughs> helping to and consulting with our worship team, who is working toward this kind of hospitality and worship and working toward being a, I mean, we're already a multi-ethnic worship team, right? but working toward being a, a fully flourishing yeah. multi-ethnic worship team, trying to get on the same page about how to communicate with each other, yeah. how to communicate musically with each other, right. how we as pastors can better support the team. Yeah. Um, yeah. And so, so part of that hopefully is also going to be like, how can we, as mostly people who don't speak Spanish as our native mm-hmm. language, mm-hmm continue to do this in a hospitable mm-hmm. and also authentic right. way. Right. Um, yeah. we, I wasn't able to be there for it, but I heard that you and Bria Jean did a wonderful job of doing that. Just that, like being 
uh, leading from that place, that authentic place, yeah. and, and also honoring our neighbors who speak Spanish at the same time. Yeah. yeah, that was such an honor to be able to be there with all of you guys, and obviously got to see you and your wife, and it was, it was a lot of fun. Yeah. It's just love, love getting to be on the ground and actually see it, and you guys living it out, because on this podcast, we, we talk a lot about multicultural ministry, and you know the reason why I wanted to bring you guys on is because you guys, it's, it's a dramatic story, you know, that you guys merged from two separate churches into one, and you're drawing out the giftings and each each demographic that came in into to one fabric. And mm-hmm. speaking of, of drawing out the giftings, uh, something that just jumped off the pages of your website when I saw it mm-hmm. was your micro ministry grants. Mm-hmm. A lot oh, of churches yeah. really struggle to, I don't know if democratize is the right word, but to really open open source the ministry of a church right. and really hear from the body of how can we serve this community? What can we do? And I think your micro ministry grants, I had never seen that before, but I think it's genius. So I want you guys to tell us, we're always looking for creative cross-cultural solutions. So mm-hmm. I think this is one of them. Yeah. Well, the micro ministry grant, uh, program, it, it was, uh, put in place to, um, um, encourage the people of the church to do the work of the church. Mm-hmm. Um, if, uh, if, if that comes from us, from this pastoral team, then we're at a loss already. Mm-hmm. And uh, um, and our job is to equip the people to do the work mm-hmm. and the micro ministry grant are incentive for them to do the work. Yeah. So basically all people have to do is have an idea to, to love the community mm-hmm. in a tangible way. Mm-hmm. If that idea costs any money mm-hmm. at all, then what they need to do is they need to get like two more people from the church who are not their immediate family mm-hmm. to to get in on the idea with them. Yeah. Just, to, just to have some like built-in sort of spirit-led accountability yeah. in the community. Like, this is a good idea. Let's yeah. So two more people join you. You write up a really, really brief grant application, yeah. and we will fund up to $300 yeah. worth of your idea, whatever it yeah, is. It's so good. And then you just come back. The only requirement is you just do it, and then you come yeah. back and you tell the church what God did. Yeah. yeah. Um, that's That's it. So it's been used a handful of times. We still got a number of grants that we want to give away. Yeah. Um, seems like the challenge uh, with that, that I mean, no, no, no program like this or idea like this just, you know, right. happens right. and it sparks and, you know, there's no challenges. But one of the challenges I think is that people are so strapped for time mm-hmm. and, and especially energy. Especially here in the Bay Area. Oh, especially in the Bay Area. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Like they're every minute of every day seems called for Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. um that to have the time and energy to sit down and think creatively about what to do Mm -hmm. is is really is really challenging and even when you create a space where you're like okay we're going to proactively think creatively Mm -hmm. about what to do Mm -hmm. that's not where like the best ideas tend to happen sure sure um and so one of the things we've learned to do is try and like be pastors and notice Mm -hmm. when people are like hey i was thinking about you know maybe the church could you know yada yada and then we can say yeah, yeah, maybe you could right, right. do that. Yeah. And we will fund it. Right. And we will support you and we'll like make, get, make connections for you yeah. to who you need to connect with. And, yeah, yeah. Um, but yeah, maybe you could do that. Yeah. yeah sometimes, sometimes leading people is not about telling them what to do, but mm. it's about giving them the tools and yeah. giving them less reasons to say no yeah. to yeah. doing that. And I think this yeah. is a, a perfect example of that. Yeah. I love it. I know. So we are here in the Siafu men's house. Um, I want you guys to tell us a little bit about what this house is um, and, and what our listeners can learn from what you guys are doing here. So uh, the Siafu Leadership Home, it is a, uh, a home for men that were recently incarcerated that are uh, um, going in or in ministry. Mm-hmm. Um, so uh, they... Uh, come to this home we have a uh, two-year apprenticeship track that they're on and uh hopefully they will be the uh, next church planners they will mm-hmm. be the next elders they will be the next deacons mm-hmm. uh in a church mm. That's and not and not necessarily in ours right yeah, yeah. i mean shoot we would really love if some of right. Them <laughs> right, right but yeah, but uh, the goal is to send them out right, right. the goal is yeah. to send them out in in mission into into urban communities because like who has, uh, who has more natural uh, leadership potential than somebody yeah. who has a story yeah. like, this is what God has done in my life. Yeah. Like right. I, he has literally brought me home. Yeah. 
Like he has literally like redeemed everything that I've done that society has said yeah. like you deserve punishment for right. it. Yeah. Right. Um, so uh, yeah, so they they come here, they do this two year apprenticeship, and then we send them out. But these guys too, I mean, Pastor Bernard. The reason we can even do this program is because Pastor Bernard has been in in San Quentin prison every week for wow. two years. Wow training these guys in a seminary level training program. That's awesome. Um, so, I mean, those relationships are already built. Yeah. Right. These guys are yeah. already primed and ready and want yeah. to serve God in ministry. Wow. Yeah. Uh, and the, 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 the name Siafu is uh, the African army ant. Mm. And, uh, you know, by itself, you can squash it. But uh, when they're together, elephants move out of the way. Wow. So it's this whole idea that we're better together. And, uh, uh, and we're an army, and uh, we want uh, uh, people to know that uh, we're a formidable army God yeah. is building yeah. uh, uh, in the urban community, yeah. uh, behind the walls. Right. Uh, he's building a formidable army, and uh, the devil's going to have to get out of the way. Yeah. What I love about that is, you know, so I've got two daughters, and, mm. you know, they're this low to the ground. <laughs> you sometimes think, you know, you're better than them because you're, you know, an adult or whatever. They can see things that I can't see yeah. because of their perspective. Uh, and sometimes the people that we see as, you know, in a lower status in society for X, Y, and Z reason, there's things that they can see that we're blind to, oh, yeah. you yeah. know, and, oh, yeah. and even you mentioning some people are just so low on time, but I've noticed about a lot of people that are in some of those disadvantaged spots is they've got plenty of time, you know, mm -hmm. and, and that's why it's so important, I think, to have this diversity in the body of Christ where we're reaching out to people that are unlike us is a lot of times we are able to complete each other and the very thing that one of us is lacking right. is sitting there right in front of us just waiting for a connection to be made. Yeah, that's exactly, that's well yeah. said. That's well said, yeah. man. So, you guys, thank you for sharing your hearts, your story. I love every bit of it. Love what you guys are doing. Love who you are. Love your friendship. Love what you guys have allowed God to build that into to be a blessing not only for the people in your congregations, but for the city of Oakland. How can people learn more about tapestry and what's one final note of encouragement that you'd leave our listeners with? Right on. Man. Well, well we, uh, you can find us at tapestryoakland.org. It's a tapestryoakland.org. Uh, we're also on Instagram at tapestryoakland. Awesome. And uh, if people want to get a hold of us by email, it's just our names at our website. So Kyle at and Bernard at tapestryoakland.org. Awesome. Uh, the nugget of encouragement um, that that I would give, uh, doing something like this, mm -hmm. pursuing multi-ethnic ministry, multicultural ministry, where it doesn't already exist, is something that will be worth it. Mm. It's something that will really be worth it. Um, and and if you don't know that in advance, if you can't mm -hmm. see that in advance, mm -hmm. like take our word for it. Yeah, there is nothing worse about life and ministry now than there was for me anyway, two years ago. Yeah. It, it's, it's all better. It's amazing. It, I mean, in the big picture, there's yeah. harder stuff, yeah. but it's better stuff. Yeah. Um, and, and it takes a little bit of courage yeah. to jump into. We, we realized that, um, as we've been processing more over the last year, what is like the deep underpinnings of what it is that we're doing here mm -hmm. that so much of what tapestry is and has become mm -hmm. is a, a community that is about overthrowing fear mm. uh, overthrowing fear with the love of god to create the peace we all long for yeah that's awesome. uh, and so so jump into it be courageous take a risk you don't know how worth it it is until you try that's so good it's amazing and i would say uh for anybody that is that wants to do something similar to what we did or or something radically different with another person yeah i would say uh uh you have to trust that person uh like nothing else mm -hmm. um the reason this works is because we trust each other with each other's lives and um mm -hmm. all the uh books we read about merger mm -hmm. no one said anything about trust <laughs> um but i found out that trust was the uh the the most uh, vital part of our relationship. Yeah. Yes. Wow, that's so good. Well, thank you guys for your courage and for, for stepping out. I can't wait for our listeners to hear your story and to learn from you guys. And um, I, I love learning from other people that have gone ahead. I love exposing our listeners to solutions, creative cross-cultural solutions that are working, that we can learn from. And uh, mm -hmm. if, I can, if I can have somebody who's just graduating from seminary listen to this and avoid mm -hmm. 10 years of maybe... <laughs> 
doing it in a way that he would have looked back and say, man, I wish I would have done this differently. Yeah. To me, that's a win. So thank you guys for, for letting this be such a blessing to, to so many people. And I can't wait to see what God does next. Man, thanks for having us on. Yeah. And, and thank you for Praise Hands and all that you're doing in your ministry. It's super important work. You're really important for the world. So oh, thanks, thanks, man. I appreciate that. Appreciate yeah. you guys.